the Buddha once said, all phenomena are rooted in desire. The word phenomena here covering everything except for nirvana, which means the path is rooted in desire, just as our defilements are rooted in desire. The difference being is that some desires are skillful and some are not. The skillful ones have some wisdom in them. There's no such thing as just brute desire without any ideas behind it. There's always a view that directs your desire, a view of what's worth doing, a view of what's okay to do. Which means that right effort has to include a lot of discernment. The Buddha never taught just brute effort, brute willpower. He taught that effort has to be guided. This is why when John Lee talks about the different mental qualities that go into mindfulness practice, mindfulness, alertness, and ardency, he assigns wisdom and discernment to ardency. Almost knowing how to stir yourself up to put up an effort, because the practice does require that we do things we don't like to do, and that we have to abstain from things that we like doing. If it was simply a matter of following your, your likes, everybody would have gained awakening a long time ago. It goes against the grain sometimes. And it's at times like that, as the Buddha said, that you really test your discernment knowing how to talk yourself into wanting to do the practice, and talking yourself into wanting to abstain from things that get in the way of the practice. It's when you find yourself having trouble getting up early in the morning or staying up late at night, or putting extra energy into the practice while you're sitting here right now. Ask yourself what, it, what desires are getting in the way and what views are informing those desires. And how can you work your way around them? Remember when I first went to stay with the John Fu, somehow the topic of sexual desire came up one day. And I mentioned it, something about how the body wants it. And he said, the body doesn't want anything at all. It's the mind. The body can live perfectly fine without getting involved. It's the mind that wants these things. And that was a way of looking at that had never occurred to me, because I was always used to justifying my desires by saying, well, this is what the body needs. As he said, the body doesn't need sex at all, or eight hours of sleep at night. You find that when you meditate, your sleep needs go down, because a lot of the rest that the mind needs you can actually get while you're meditating. But sometimes it's better than sleep and being restful. So ask yourself when a desire comes up either to do something that's against the practice or not to do something that is involved in the practice, what's the view behind that? What reasons does the mind give? Sometimes it's very parsimonious and very secretive about its reasons, which means that probably its reasons are pretty bad. Other times it will say, well, of course, and then it goes on to say what, what it thinks is so obvious that there's no need to talk about it. Those are the reasons you've got to question. Learn how to question them. Look at them from different angles. This is where it's useful to read Dharma books, to get ideas of other ways of looking at what's going on in your mind. I was reading recently a passage by John Fun, John Sowet's teacher. He's talking about how doctors usually tell us that the causes of disease come from outside, but the potential for disease, he says, is already there in the body. You're born with this potential for things to malfunction. The body can malfunction just as easily as it can function well. So it's perfectly normal for things to get diseased. And a lot of times the problem is inside the body. It doesn't come from the germs. It's because the body's own resistance is not up to things which puts a different spin on health, 
and what we think of is our right to health or the things that the body should be functioning in a particular way. So it's good to read Dharma books that give you a new perspective on things, look at things from another angle. So when the mind comes up with it, of course I've got to rest, or of course I can't do this, or of course I've got to do that, you can start questioning the of courseness of those things. And this is how your wisdom grows. You begin to think outside the box. Because awakening is not going to be in the box at all. The box of your ideas of what's possible and what's normal have to change. If you're going to find something that's beyond your ordinary sense of what's possible. An awakening is not normal. What's normal is aging, illness, and death. That's what nature has for us. We're not just here to follow nature, or at least the nature of looking for survival. We're looking for something better. We're looking for true happiness. This was where Buddhism, the Buddhist teachings, part ways with modern science. Modern science says the body is all about survival. We're biological organisms, and that's our main purpose. The Buddha says, no, our purpose is to find happiness. This is what that rooted in desire means. We desire happiness, well-being, bliss. However you want to translate the word sukha. It's simply have to gain new ideas about what that bliss is, what that happiness can be, and how, go, how to go about it. You have to think outside the box if we're not going to be boxed in by aging, illness, and death. It's just not simply a matter of willpower. It's a matter of talking yourself into having a right view that will inform your efforts as to what's worthwhile. What's a good use of your time, and how much energy you have, and how much you're willing to sacrifice? In the forest tradition, they often ask, are you afraid to die? And anywhere else in the world, it would be normal to say, well, yes. But for them, it's the, an the obvious answer is, no, I'm here to find something that is worth dying for. It requires that kind of dedication and the views that go with that. And here we're willing to die for something that's really good, a happiness that doesn't harm anybody. Beginning to see that death is not the worst thing possible. The worst thing possible is to do something unskillful. And the biggest loss is when you have an opportunity to practice and you throw it away. The loss that comes from loss of health, loss of wealth, even loss of relatives, the Buddha said. That doesn't drag you down to hell. It's loss in terms of your view, loss in terms of your virtue. That can. So look at your views. Try to develop a sense of values that is outside the ordinary. You'll learn how to question things that you've not been questioning before. Sanjaya Mahabhava has some good questions for questioning pain. When you first read them, they sound kind of strange. You know, is the pain the same thing as your knee? But then you begin to realize part of your mind actually believes that it is. And you wouldn't have thought about that unless you'd asked the question. When the food is not up to your, what you expect, you can ask yourself, well, I'm here to eat. And this part of the mind says, well, yes, I'm here to eat. But the other part says, no, we're here to practice. Whether it's chores around the monastery, you say, this is hard to do. Remind yourself, this is an opportunity to get, make merit. There's opportunities for merit all over the place. Every leaf out of place on the road 
is an opportunity for merit. Every little thing out of order is an opportunity, opportunity to make merit. This is why we don't assign jobs for everybody, or at least hover over you to make sure certain jobs are done. There are certain jobs that are left for people to want to do. And so sometimes the chores may get tedious if you find that you're the only one who's doing a particular chore, but remind yourself you're just stocking up on merit. Look at it in a different way, as an opportunity rather than a chore. In fact, this might be one area where it's really useful to stop and think what your attitudes toward merit are. It's one of those concepts that doesn't get much good press in Western Buddhism, but it's what drives a lot of Buddhist practice. The realization that, yes, even though we are here to learn how to let go, still to let go we have to develop good qualities in the mind. One of the best ways of developing them is to start on the ground. In other words, with basic chores. Remember when I first went to stay with the John Fu, he made a comment one evening that all too many people think that the practice is just about letting go, letting go, but it's also about developing. And at the time, I didn't really appreciate what he was saying. With time, I began to, though. That you can't expect the John to give you pep talks all the pep talks all the time. You've got to develop your own ability to come up with new questions, come up with new ways of looking at an issue so that you're happy to develop good qualities in the mind and keep on building them, even if nobody recognizes or seems to recognize what's happening. There is an objective quality to the merit of a mind that's always looking to do what's good. I was reading recently about a study where they had noticed how kids in industrialized countries tend not to learn how to do chores around the house, whereas kids in more traditional societies do, and they're happy to do them. It turns out there's a particular age where kids really want to be helpful. They want to do real jobs around the house. And if the parents are wise enough to put up with the fact that the kids are not yet expert at these things, it can be somewhat clumsy, but are willing to put up with that and give them pointers on how to do things, eventually the kids become really helpful and they enjoy being helpful. And that's wise. It's wise to encourage them, and it's wise for them. This is what merit's all about, is finding joy and being helpful. To nourish that part of the mind that wants not only happiness, but a happiness that doesn't harm anybody. And a happiness that's actually good for other people. And not all of us here practicing are going to be able to teach the Dharma to other people, but you can be a good influence. You can be a good example. So in that way, your Dharma practice does help others. I mean, you take joy in finding happiness that doesn't harm anybody. That comes from this desire to be helpful. So learn to think outside of the box so that your old ideas don't box you in. And remember, remember that awakening does not lie in the box either. So find new ways of thinking, find new ways of viewing things, so that the effort becomes something you really want to do, so the desire to stick with the practice energizes your path. And that you're able to find ways of thinking that keep that energy going. And build it to higher and higher levels. Even when the body seems to be weak. You want to make the mind strong, not just through brute willpower, but strong through the realization that doing the practice is good. We learn from practice that meditation can be really comfortable, really energizing. And keeping that in the back of your mind should always help you on days when it's hard to get up or it's hard to stay up. 
but it just might happen that this time things click. And you'll be glad you made that extra effort. <laughs>